Good morning and welcome to the Early College Co Coalition's latest event, Early College Ce Celebrating Leadership and Growth with a special visit to South Coast. Today, you can expect to hear from members of the Early College Coalition about the latest research efforts and from our state leaders and educational leaders working in districts, institutions of higher ed and community-based organizations who are working diligently to elevate the great work happening with the early college program throughout the Commonwealth and who are striving for its growth. It's such a pleasure today to be joined by distinguished leaders such as Commissioner Santiago, Chairman Aaron Michaelwitz, Chairman Michael Rodriguez, and Chairman Roy. My name is Manny Cruz, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Advocacy Director at Latinos for Education, where I lead our advocacy and policy efforts at the state level. And I'm also an elected member of Salem's School Committee, and the first Afro-Latino to hold this position in our city's history. I'd like to begin our program by thanking members of the Early College Coalition, Mass Inc., the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education, Empower Schools, and our key partners in philanthropy for their ongoing advocacy and collaboration to advance early college in our state. Latinos for Education is proud to be part of this incredible coalition. At Latinos for Education, our mission is to develop, place, and connect essential Latino leaders in the education sector. And we're building an ecosystem of Latino advocates by infusing Latino talent into positions of influence. Our work is primarily focused on elevating the voices of educators of color and increasing retention and promotional rates. Last year as an organization, we embarked on a journey to begin to advocate for key policy changes and, and started joining multi-sector coalitions in order to advance early college uh, and other key policies in our states to create greater equity for Latino students. Through my role as both the advocacy director and a school committee member, I know that we have to be focused on advancing key policies given our limited resources and initiatives that must have a clear impact on greater equity for all of our students. Early college program is one such game-changing policy that has demonstrated that it is not only equitable, but that it will truly change the lives of our historically underrepresented students in the Commonwealth. And at Latinos for Education, we firmly believe that this program can be a catalyst for building a more diverse STEM workforce and educator pipeline. In my own backyard in Salem, we know just how important this program is, as we have pursued the early college designation and partnered with incredible organizations like Leap for Education, Mass Higher and Salem State to offer this program to our students. We have incredible vision for this program and we one day hope that we can expand it to become a fifth year program that will allow our students in our community to pursue up to 60 college credits. The promise of early college is quite clear and we are so excited to be working with our coalition members to continue to scale this program up for students across our Commonwealth. The implications for our students is that they are going to maintain critical supports, that they can achieve significant savings, and that they'll have the confidence and skill sets to accomplish everything that they're capable of achieving and com eventually complete a college degree. Early college is clearly a game-changing policy and worthy of our support. It is with great pleasure that I can introduce now our first speaker in our program my friend and an ally of the Early College Coalition, Commissioner Carlos Santiago, who is a champion for educational equity in higher education and in our Commonwealth. At Latinos for Education, Commissioner Santiago has partnered with us many times and is a dear friend of the Early College Coalition. And we feel so honored to work with the commissioner to ensure that as a Commonwealth, we are prioritizing the transformation of our higher education system to create greater educational equity for students who have been historically underrepresented and to shift our college campuses to being equity centered and student ready. Commissioner. Good morning, uh, everyone. Buenos dias a todos. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Manny. Uh, and thank you for your continued partnership and for your essential work advocating for our historically underserved students. Uh, and good morning to everyone here. I'm glad to be with all of you today and to see such a dynamic group of early college stakeholders as part of this agenda. Uh, this event itself demonstrates the commitment to early college in Massachusetts, the investment and advocacy from our governor, legislature, board of higher education, board of elementary and secondary education and its leadership from community organizations, foundations, the business community, school districts, as well as our campuses. 
It also demonstrates the commitment our students have made to our educational system, to their lives, and to the future of the Commonwealth. As most of you know, early college has grown exponentially in the last few years since we established the early college designation. And that growth has been made possible through the investment of time, energy, political capital, and the dollars necessary to make early college succeed and grow. I want to particularly thank our legislative friends here today for your consistent advocacy and investment. This year's budget was reflected of true partnership and is what has allowed us to expand to meet the growth potential of this essential program. I know Senator uh, Roderick and Representative Mikowitz and Representative Roy, a uh, good friend, are on the agenda today. So I wanna thank them personally for their support. And if there are other members of the legislature in the audience, please know that you have our gratitude as well. As the Commissioner of Higher Education, I'm grateful to the essential K through 12 higher ed partnership with Commissioner Riley and our DESE colleagues. And it is great to see both secondary and higher education educators on the agenda today, representing those who have invested the imperative human labor that makes early college possible. I'm grateful to our educators who are able to see their students as whole human beings, who recognize the wealth of knowledge and experience that these students bring to the classroom and the ways students help instruct us on the reality of the world from their perspective. And given my role, I want to personally acknowledge and thank the work of those on our campuses who provide students the opportunity to take actual college coursework, high quality coursework while in high school, who help bridge the transition from high school to college and meet students in a way that empowers them to understand themselves as college students and to imagine themselves as college graduates. As many of you know, the top policy and performance priority of the Department of Higher Education is racial equity, known as the equity agenda. While the Massachusetts Early College designation predates the official launch of the equity agenda, it is one of the first ways we began to embed equity-minded policymaking in our work. And it continues to be a way we commit ourselves to narrowing the vast disparities in how we serve our racially minoritized students, particularly Black and Latinx students. We embedded that commitment in the way we designed this initiative and have seen that intentionality manifest in the last few years. Currently, 61% of students in our 31 early college programs are Black or Latinx, and 50% of high schools in our gateway cities have early college programs. Our data is showing that early college students are attending college at a higher rate than their peers at, at their schools and across the state, and positive results have been consistent across race and across economic status. We also saw a positive impact on faster completion rates among early college students, one indicator that early college is making a difference to ensure that our high school students are accessing higher education opportunities. We are pleased with these indicators, of course, and we also know that it's not enough to ensure that students are exposed to and attending college but that our institutions meet all students in a way that seeks to eradicate the continuing barriers to students who are responsible for unconscionable racial disparities. So our early college efforts are aligned with our work to ensure that someday race no longer determines students' outcomes in our public institutions. I should point out that we now have uh, approximately uh, between 4,000 and 5,000 students in our early college programs and 31 designated programs. We need to grow, we need to expand, and we need to expand rapidly because we know it works. Our goal at this point is to grow to 16,000 students. That means greater participation from existing programs as well as new programs as well. So thanks again to all of you. Thank you to Mass Inc, MBAE, and Latinos for Education for your consistent and essential advocacy on behalf of our students and for sponsoring this important conversation. And thanks to the many of you who have been advocating for the investment in this work to ensure that it grows. Manny, back to you. Thank you, Commissioner. It's always such a pleasure to be with you. I'm so grateful for your leadership, commitment, and the incredible work that you're doing at the department with respect to the equity agenda. I am very excited to introduce our next speaker, Erica G. M. Petro, the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Alliance for Early College. 
I've had the pleasure of working with Erica through her roles at both Empower Schools and now with the Massachusetts Alliance for Early College. I want to express my gratitude to Erica for her continued advocacy and efforts to ensure that we continue the good work of being critical friends of state leaders as we work towards expanding critical programs such as early college in our state. Erica, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Can you hear me, Manny? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, good morning, all. This was not the right morning to wake up without a voice. I'm going to do my best to be loud and clear, but please forgive me if I'm not. I'm honored to have the opportunity on behalf of our many partners to make remarks today and grateful to Mass Inc, MBAE, and Latinos for Education for hosting this event. I want to start by stating what so many of you already know, that the best predictor of college success is college success. This is the core principle behind early college. What this looks like in Massachusetts is that high school students take up to two years worth of college classes, specifically sequenced towards a college degree during their regular high school day at no cost to them. They receive enhanced academic and guidance support to ensure that they thrive in the rigorous college coursework and the new setting. Early college mitigates for the three key barriers to college success. Number one, it reduces the cost of college. Number two, it reduces the time it takes to earn the college degree. And number three, it builds students' confidence, habits, and skills needed to be successful in college and career. Early college in Massachusetts has grown since the initiative formally started five years ago. We are anticipating more than 4,000 students this school year, despite the pandemic's challenges and 15 programs are currently applying for new state designations on top of that, with many others expressing interest in future designation cycles. And I wanna highlight something I'm personally very excited about. There's over two and a half million dollars in this year's state budget for grants, encouraging program growth and program depth. So more students taking a larger number of college credits. These grants will be posted imminently and Commissioner Riley has committed to using a portion of the department's ESSER funds to extend these grants to be multi-year. These opportunities are a testament to the commitment at multiple levels to seeing this initiative grow. And the reason that growth in programming is such a good thing is because time and time again, we're learning that early college is working. Designated early college programs in Massachusetts are young. So we don't yet have the college completion data, which is what really matters. But for our earliest class of graduates, 58% remain in college today versus 38% of their school peers. That's a, that's a rate 50% higher than their comparison. And importantly, the students in early college programs are nearly two thirds black and Latinx and half are economically disadvantaged. It's worth noting the commitment to evaluation here by the state and thanks to investment from the Smith Family Foundation. This evaluation on a frequent and ongoing basis will allow us to learn and evolve the program over time based on what's working. Consistent with these strong outcomes, we're seeing more and more public calls for early college growth. You can see here recent reports and studies out from key organizations, including the Massachusetts Education Equity Partnership, the Senate Committee on Reimagining Massachusetts Post-Pandemic Resiliency, the Mass Taxpayer Foundation, the Boston Globe, and in the, pre the, the key priorities for both Commissioners Santiago and Riley, and through remarks from Governor Baker. So we talked about where we've been and where we are currently. Now let's talk about where we'll go. In April this year, Mass Inc. published a paper arguing for an early college scale goal of 45,000 students about six years from now. The logic was simple. Early college is working. There's a moral imperative to see it scale. This is a goal that is both highly ambitious. It's consistent with closing a quarter of the college success gap for the state and feasible. Meeting this goal would translate to roughly 15% of all seniors or five to six times growth from where we are now. And we hope that the new Alliance for Early College can help to meet this ambitious goal. Earlier this year, the State Street Foundation funded a study to explore how to take early college from a successful pilot to a robust scaled offering. The study concluded with a recommendation to form an alliance, an entity that can help to coalesce the broad set of stakeholders to supportive of early college, 
from community-based and college success and business organizations to philanthropists and thought leaders. As a result, we're forming the Massachusetts Alliance for Early College. We will be officially launching early in the new year and will be focused in three key areas. Number one, collective impact and coalition building. Number two, program quality and technical assistance. And number three, policy and funding conditions. As we get closer to launch, I look forward to being in touch with many of you about how you can be a part of the Alliance. I wanna conclude with a few thank yous. First, Commissioner Santiago and Riley, Secretary Pizer, the governor and others in the Baker administration for all of your leadership and work to design and lead the state's efforts. Uh, Commissioner Santiago, your equity agenda is providing such a strong base for these efforts. Members of the legislature and Ways and Means Chairs, Rodericks and Michaelowitz, who increased funding for early college in this year's budget from five and a half to 11 million. The legislature has played a critical role in leading and driving the work of this initiative. Representative Jeff Roy and his co-author, Representative Kate Lipper-Garabedian for their leadership in crafting a really exciting, recently filed college and high school bill. As well as the many educators, community leaders, philanthropists, families, and especially students that make this work a reality. And a special thanks to today's participants and those of you who are tuning in to watch, to be a part of this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica, for your presentation and your friendship. Latinos for Education is so proud to be a founding member of the Massachusetts Alliance for Early College and of the Early College Coalition. The data and story that you have brought forward clearly demonstrate the need and vision we should have for expanding early college. As I stated at the onset of our program today, this is also a celebration of the legislative leaders who have made early college expansion possible by advocating for key legislative changes in sustainable and appropriate state funding levels. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by the chairs of Ways and Means on both the Massachusetts House of Representatives and the State Senate. I've had the pleasure of working with both of the chairs of Ways and Means, State Representative Aaron Michaelwitz and State Senator Michael Rodericks in both of my previous roles in the legislature and now at Latinos for Education. Each of them holds such an important position in the legislature and perhaps one of the most difficult as there are so many good causes that advocates push for. Chairman Rodericks and Chairman Michaelowitz have been staunch supporters of early college and their deep commitment to the program is clear with their multi-million dollar increases to the program year after year that will ensure that the students who have been historically underrepresented continue to have access to this game-changing and transformational policy. Thank you both for your tremendous leadership, commitment to equity for our students and friendship to the Early College Coalition. It is with great pleasure that I now invite Chairman Rodericks and Chairman Michaelwitz to provide brief remarks. Chairman Rodericks, welcome to the stage. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Manny, and good morning to uh, this entire uh, group that's gathered here today to celebrate uh, and to speak about uh, early college. Um, you know, Chairman Michaelwitz and I um, were both appointed respective chairs of our Ways and Means Committees about the same time um, at the start of the FY20 uh, budget. And if you look at uh, the line items where early college in, in FY 2019, it was 1.75 million. Last year was $5 million for early college. Uh, dual enrollment was $970,000. Um, in FY18, and it's $6 million now in FY22. And that just shows and proves to all of you our commitment to these two programs that are really working. And as I meet with countless advocates, um, all lobbying for really important causes, whether it's education, whether it's food security, whether it's housing stability, whether it's the homelessness crisis, the substance abuse crisis, you name it, um, Chairman Michaelwitz and I um, are constantly meeting with individuals and trying to do our best uh, to provide the resources to deal with the issues. I always tell um, the advocates, you know, dollars follow data. And the fact is that 
uh, this organization and these groups have done such a tremendous job of providing us the data and reinforcing to Chair Mikowitz and I um, how important it is that we do invest in these areas. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy uh, that uh, we're moving um, every year, we're moving in a positive direction. I thank all of you. I congratulate all of you uh, for your successes. And um, I do want to wish my, my good friend and partner, Chairman Michael Witz, the best of luck today. He's got a long day today in session. Hopefully you get it all done. You might drag into tomorrow, I'm assuming. But, you know, um, if, if, if they, the House has the best man at the helm navigating the fiscal issues over uh, in the House side. And I'd love to uh, now turn it over to my good friend and partner, Chairman Aaron Michaelowitz. Thank you, Michael. I, I, the sentiments uh, are returned uh, to you uh, as well. And uh, I guess good timing. I came, I got right in right when you were uh, speaking. So uh, uh, we are in the midst of going through uh, all the uh, amendments right now uh, for uh, the ARPA funds uh, and uh, just have meeting with my colleagues uh, through Zooms. And so it's, uh, I apologize for being a little bit late, but uh, we are trying to uh, uh, wade through this discussion uh, by, you know, try to do it today, maybe tomorrow at the latest, but uh, uh, there is a lot to discuss here with a lot of important initiatives on the table. And it's, um, you know, these are, there's a lot of good decisions, but there are, there are some difficult ones as well. Uh, but I wanted to make some, take some time and, and, and come on here and, and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what we feel uh, is an important issue in itself, and that's early college in Massachusetts. And I, I commend everyone uh, for their hard work and congratulate everyone on their hard work. Uh, every year when we are uh, going through uh, budget initiatives and trying to, to make these these difficult decisions, uh, we want to see uh, you know results. We want to see things that are uh, that are going to be meaningful. And the early college uh, um, investments have really shown to be meaningful and have really shown to be really successful. Uh, and so that's why it is a it is a program that we are. Uh, you know, happy to continue to, to support. I was actually uh, talking, uh, texting with the governor last night, actually, because he, he was asking me a little bit about the ARPA funds here. And then we started getting into an early college discussion. I don't know if he knew I was coming on here today, but but he started saying that he met with the, the Ben Franklin Institute uh, in uh, in my district uh, and what a great, you know, work they do and, 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 and how, what a great example they are. And uh, I was telling, I had to inform them, unfortunately, that they are moving out of my district. They're moving into Nubian Square, uh, still in the city of Boston, uh, but to a new facility that are going to hopefully provide even better services. But I think more importantly, it just it just shows you, you know, what kind of investments we are trying to make. And uh, they're a great example of what exactly how this can work uh, very successfully. I also am very lucky. I have, uh, you know, Bunker Hill Community College right nearby uh, that has a lot of uh, pieces uh, in here. Uh, you know, through through either Charleston High or Chelsea or Chelsea High, uh, but actually, you know, students uh, that live in my district, the families that live in my district, have taken advantage of this, uh, and it's something that I'm uh, I'm grateful for. Uh, you know, and so I'm grateful for the work that's being done. Uh, I see uh, that Chairman Roy is going to be uh, part of this conversation. He was one of the first to kind of get this ball moving uh, when he was the chair of higher ed. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he uh, you know, he sold this to a lot of his colleagues uh, and sold it well. Uh, and we were lucky that we were uh, uh, to uh, to jump on board as well as hearing from the governor as well. So I appreciate all the work that's being done. Uh, I look forward to further conversations on how we can better uh, support early college uh, in Massachusetts and something that we are going to continue to work on, uh, not just in the House, but I know, uh, as Senator Roderick said, as, as a collaborative uh, discussion with with both the House and the Senate and the administration. And uh, I would share my sentiments and say that the, the Senate is very lucky to have Senator Rodericks uh, as the chair. Uh, he is uh, not just a gentleman to work with, but uh, just uh, always coming up with good ideas on how we can move the ball forward here uh, for the, in the Commonwealth. So thank you for having me and, uh, and uh, congratulations to everyone. And I look forward to uh, you know talking further. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks both to you and um... Uh, Senator Rodericks for the invaluable support. You know, when you consider the significant progress that's been made in such a short period of time, you know it would not have been possible uh, without legislative leaders, uh, in particular, these two chairs of the Ways and Means Committees. They get it, they understand the positive impact of early college, and that's a good thing for this movement and for the students of Massachusetts. Again, thanks to all of you for joining. My name is Ed Lambert. I'm the Executive Director of the Mass Business Alliance for Education. I want to thank my friend and co-host Manny Cruz for so effectively stewarding the program to this point. I will try to 
uh, follow and the great example that he has set. Uh, now we're going to hear from some leaders in the south coast region of our state as we put a spotlight on the early successes uh, for early college in a part of the Commonwealth, uh, honestly, where there's a great need for effective student success strategies. Uh, the South Coast includes the cities of Fall River and New Bedford, as well as other suburban and even some rural, uh, rural areas. Uh, we know that in particular in our gateway cities, uh, there's an urgent need to increase the number of students going to, persisting in, and graduating from college with post-secondary degrees uh, that effective early college programs can help make that happen. Uh, and that success is one of the things that is getting folks in our region uh, of the state in the South Coast uh, very excited. So I wanna welcome our panel this morning and ask them to join uh, the conversation. This morning, we wanna welcome leaders from each of the important early college partnership sectors. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Drew Woodward. Drew is the Director of Guidance for the Fall River Public Schools. And he's gonna talk with us a little bit uh, about um, the uh, happenings on the ground at Durfee High School. Uh, let us know some of the details and impacts of the early college program there. We're also gonna hear from uh, a great partner of Durfee's and uh, so many other uh, K through 12 uh, systems and schools in the South Coast. And that would be the president of Bristol Community College, Dr. Laura Douglas, who's gonna join us as well. Uh, we'll get to hear some of the business perspective uh, from Julie gagliardi Ramos, Julie is a, a vice president at Bay Coast Bank. They are a member uh, of uh, MBAE and Julie sits on our advisory board. She also serves on the UMass Board of Trustees. She's a member of the Somerset School Committee and chair of the Education Committee of the South Coast Chamber. So what do you do in your free time, Julie? Uh, and we're going to hear a little bit about uh, the ship engagement and advocacy for early college in the South Coast. And, and last and certainly not least, we're gonna hear from Thomas Anderson, uh, the dynamic superintendent of the New Bedford Public Schools. So let's get our panel started. Drew, let's start with you, uh, if we could. Give us some history of the program there. What's the status of it today and, and potentially even uh, some of the vision for the future. Sure, thank you, Ed, and thank you everyone uh, for having me here today. I'm really excited just for a couple of brief moments to talk about early college in Fall River, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, this is our second year of designation from the state. We are currently uh, uh, the only designated uh, program in the South Coast, although many others uh, uh, hope to join us in, in the next couple of months. Um, one, of, one of the big things I want to start off by thinking is one of, one of the reasons I believe for our early success is we've had complete support um, from our Fall River community, uh, from everything from the, our school committee and our elected officials uh, to our superintendent, our school-based administration, as well as our higher ed partners, Bridgewater Community, uh, Bridgewater uh, State University and Bristol Community College and the Chamber of Commerce and the business community here. Um, so just to talk a little bit about our uh, early college program here at Durfee High School. Uh, we launched last year in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic with 89 juniors and seniors. This year, uh, uh, we're up to 134 juniors and seniors and we're in the process of onboarding about 80 sophomores. So we're hoping to grow from about 89 last year to about 215 uh, this year. Our program is aligned uh, to, to careers, especially in the South Coast, but across the Massachusetts Commonwealth. We selected uh, two pathways, career pathways uh, with our partners, Bristol Community College, and that is business and medical health sciences. And we chose those because those are the fastest growing in the South Coast. Uh, with our partners, Bridgewater State University, uh, we selected education and social service leadership. We really wanted to expose our students uh, to areas in education and other organizations uh, within Fall River and the South Coast where they could give back or provide leadership in their home and surrounding communities. The design of our early college program is for students to take two or more classes per semester. Uh, so uh, most of our students earn between 18 and 36 credits by the time that they graduate. All of our uh, classes are aligned uh, to the mass transfer, which means they automatically transfer to any state, UMass or community college uh, in the Commonwealth and most private institutions as well. And many of our classes are aligned to specific uh, career fields, but also have those transferable skills that you need for any college uh, major. One of the things that we uh, are really focused on in our first two years in early college and as we expand is the equity and access piece uh, that many have spoke about uh, already. Uh, one of our implementation goals has been uh, for our students is, is that we meet or exceed the demographics of our school and those underserved populations in higher ed. 
Uh, so just to give you an example of our success to date, um, just in a couple categories, um, for, for example, African-American students make up about 10% of Durfee's population and about 19% of our early college program. Uh, students who are low income make up about 69% of Durfee's population uh, and about 73% of our um, early college program. Students whose first language is not English make up about 30% of Durfee's uh, population and about 33% of our program. So we're proud uh, you know, of our early success you know, within the first two years that we're really uh, breaking down historical barriers and increasing the access uh, to our students who have historically uh, been underrepresented in higher ed. One of the reasons um, that I wanted to highlight, I wanted the uh, uh, aspects of our early college program that I wanted to highlight uh, briefly uh, is our support mechanism. And we've learned through the pandemic uh, that uh, support is so key and necessary uh, for the success of our students in early college. And we partner with two really critical organizations in addition uh, to uh, our partnerships with Bridgewater and Bristol Community College that are, are really transforming our early college work. The first is uh, One Goal. Uh, One Goal is a program that we brought into Durfee a couple years ago and have uh, really collaborated uh, with uh, for our early college program. Uh, they, uh, they embark in a three-year kind of partnership with our early college students where they train a, a Durfee teacher to kind of serve as an advisor, a program director, and create this community of practice uh, for early college students. Uh, they stay in the classroom um, when students are not taking early college classes to provide support. Uh, work on goal setting, college planning, and also ensure success in the classroom. Those students and teachers stay together not only during the junior and senior years of high school, but that teacher follows the students uh, for their freshman year in high school in advisory capacity. Uh, the other key uh, organization that I want to highlight in our success is JFY Network, who provides really comprehensive academic tutoring and college readiness skills for our early college students, making sure that they're college ready, uh, specifically working on reading and writing skills that we know are so critical in college success, but also just the general college success uh, type of skills, how to email a professor, how to um, advocate for yourself when you're struggling in a class. Finally, um, our support, uh, we've been lucky to uh, add a full-time early college advisor this year in, in, in Fall River. And that person has been critical in coordinating support and outreach to students and also uh, collaborating with our higher ed partners uh, as well as our nonprofit partners. I want to highlight uh, our, our partnership with Bristol Community College in Bridgewater State. Uh, you know, we've really worked hard on setting up consistent bi-weekly planning meetings to discuss challenges, adjust practice, plan celebrations, and really highlight the work of our students. So in my last minute or two, I want to talk a little bit about the goals and progress to date. And we're seeing some really, um, really interesting and powerful kind of results uh, uh, in our early college program. Last year, uh, which I mentioned was our first year of early college uh, as a designated program, uh, our students earned over 500 transferable college credits through our early college program and saved $128,583 in tuition fees uh, uh, and books and, and whatnot. And that's critical to our early college program. We're saving uh, families uh, a lot of money and we have a commitment to make our early college program 100% uh, free of charge uh, for students. In addition, we're seeing uh, success of enrollment in, in higher education. 93% of our seniors enrolled in an institution of higher education, either a two or four year uh, college last school year. And we're proud of that fact because uh, in the midst of the pandemic, there are many challenges uh, to post-secondary enrollment. Um, and we worked closely uh, with our uh, higher ed partners uh, to ensure that uh, students had a variety of options uh, to attend. In addition, we're seeing success at the high school level as well. Our students in, enrolled in the early college program had uh, a failure rate four times lower than those not in the program. The chronic absenteeism rate of our early college uh, students were 50% lower than the traditional Durfee student not enrolled in our program. In addition, uh, when we look at advanced coursework, the number of students uh, taking at least one college class such as AP or dual enrollment, we're seeing significant increases across the board. For example, for our English language learner population in 2019, only 11% of those students uh, uh, took one or more uh, college level class in high school. In 2021, that rose to 37%. And once we uh, get the numbers in for this year, we expect that to grow higher. For our special ed population, only 2% of our special ed population uh, took advantage of college coursework while in high school. 
in 2020, that was 15%, uh, a huge 700% increase of students accessing coursework. And again, we expect that to grow. This year, um, we're expecting students to earn uh, over 1,284 transferable college credit, which is really going uh, to save them over $345,000 towards their, uh, uh, collectively towards their college um, education. We, are also, uh, we also have a key goal of 90% or higher of our, our graduates attending for a two-year uh, college institutions. So next steps and where do we wanna go from here? We're seeing uh, a lot of success uh, so we want to expand and scale up. Uh, our goals are really to have over 20% of each grade level enroll in early college so that we can really maximize the impact of this transformative initiative. To do that, we also want to scale up support. Uh, so we want to have a full 10th grade kind of uh, scale up uh, support mechanism in place, an early college seminar for students enrolled in the program, really scaling up uh, their, uh, their, their college uh, successes. Um, and finally, we want to add additional pathways that align with the labor market, such as STEM or technology, uh, so that we can offer more opportunities to students. Thank you for the time, uh, and I'll kick it back over to Ed. Thank you, Ed. Well, thanks a lot. And before I ask uh, our other panelists to kind of weigh in on, on some of this and their own aspects of this, I, I wonder, uh, you know, Durfee opened a brand new high school uh, this year. Kids or at least students are back in classrooms. Uh, as opposed to the on and off of last year. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering, and by the way, there's some great data and statistics that you just shared, awesome. Um, what are you hearing um, uh, in terms of reaction from students, uh, from staff thus far about the program, with the level of enthusiasm? And what are they, uh, what are they relaying back to you and others? Absolutely. I think the staff and the students are really excited about these early college initiatives. Uh, one of the key kind of, um, uh, strategic plans that we made in our early college uh, program was to collaborate with as many teachers and staff in our building uh, from the jump. Uh, so we do have teachers uh, serving as co-professors in some classes. We have teachers serving uh, as academic tutors. Uh, so uh, we have a, a huge degree of investment here at Durfee, which has really helped uh, bring in the culture of early college. Um, the students are really excited, especially this year. Last year, uh, they were fully virtual for the most part. Uh, this year, they're on Bristol Community College campus. Uh, so they're getting that really uh, college feel uh, which is, and that live interaction with professors, which is a key enhancement uh, to our early college program. So the buzz is growing uh, in Durfee around early college. True, thanks so much. Keep up the great work. Um, uh, Bristol Community College is such an important uh, component, uh, such an important part of the fabric in the South Coast region. And President Douglas uh, has not only been a more than willing partner, she's been an initiator of so many important conversations. President Douglas, we welcome you today and we'd love to hear a little bit uh, from the higher ed partnership perspective, uh, both uh, in, not only in response to what uh, Drew has said, but your thoughts about the program overall and, and the impact it's having. Well, thank you so much, Ed. We're so excited to, to talk about our early college programs and we have great partners and, and really that's the crux of it all. So we do have uh, one early college designation with Durfee High School in Fall River. However, we have two applications in for next year. One is with New Bedford High School and the other uh, in New Bedford, of course, and the other is with Argosy Charter School in Fall River. So why is early college important to our region? Um, and you know, we talk about all the great things of early college, but lots of people don't understand that here uh, in Bristol County, and especially our gateway cities of Fall River and New Bedford, um, we have low college going rates. Only about 28% of our population uh, uh, has a college degree. And the median family income in Fall River and New Bedford is about $40,000 a year. That's $40,000 for a family. And that's not much to live on. Uh, early college puts our students, especially those that might not think that college is within reach on a pathway to a sustainable career and wages. Uh, and we know as well that our students in Bristol County are very likely to live the rest of their lives in our region. So this is a great investment uh, for um, our economy, but also for our families and our students to have uh, healthy and engaged uh, lives. 
So we have been uh, very deliberate, uh, as Drew had mentioned, in aligning our col early college programs to our local economic blueprint. Uh, our conversations have been focusing uh, around uh, careers in health sciences, life sciences, engineering, offshore wind, cybersecurity, business and finance. And uh, as we educate and we train uh, students, uh, we are also seeing new companies landing in our region. So we've got this great relationship now where we're training for jobs and new industry and we're bringing in companies who really can support uh, the wages um, and the career pathways that we want to see. When we talk to parents about early college, uh, you know, not everyone starts off saying, oh, I want my kid to, uh, to participate. But when they hear about what happens when a student goes to college in the terms of saving money, saving tuition, um, uh, having the opportunity to, to just very seamlessly uh, move into the community college after high school or to go to a four-year institution. Um, and then they learn about what it means to earn at that level after you have achieved the associate or bachelor's degree, they become very, very excited. Uh, and uh, that has been really wonderful, connecting uh, education and wages and just a really healthy, happy, engaged life. Uh, life. And so here in Massachusetts, we are looking to scale up early college and we know what it's going to take. It's gonna take some uh, financial investment. Uh, we need to have appropriate staffing uh, and our staffing, as Drew had mentioned, you know, we need to have a lot of wraparound services. It's not just delivering college courses on campus, it's having the support to help those students be uh, successful. It's those strong partnerships between college and also our high school and community partners. Um, this infrastructure is, is just the critical piece. We have to trust each other. Uh, we have to be ready to learn from each other. Uh, and we have learned a lot. In fact, uh, Bristol and Durfee, uh, we have really evolved into a strong program and we have learned about the secret sauce, right, Drew? We have learned our secret sauce. And that is in addition to funding and our partnership, we have to have the wraparound services. Our students are first generation, they need high touch, high, high touch. And when we invest that, especially in that first year, we see wonderful results in terms of their GPA, their commitment, their attendance. Uh, and this is, again, critically important because these students, many are first generation. Uh, and when we see the outcomes, especially as they relate to the equity agenda in a, increasing the number of BIPOC students who are in the program and their outcomes, uh, we know this uh, secret sauce uh, is really important. So we know the recipe, right, uh, for early college. It's, uh, we know that it needs that secret sauce. We know that we need uh, instructional support, administrative support, tutoring, advising, free textbooks. We use open educational resources uh, or free textbooks uh, as much as we possibly can to keep those costs down. Um, but it's also a time for us to grow and develop our coalitions and consortia to share and learn best practices and really organize uh, within the Commonwealth to make uh, um, uh, early college successful. I want to share that in southeastern Massachusetts, we have the Connect Partnership. That's a partnership between the six public institutions of higher education. And at this time, only three of the six have early college programs. Um, and, you know, we have to build early college into our strategic plans. We built it into our Bristol Community College strategic plan. We just recently built it into our Connect strategic plan. The goal is for every one of our six public institutions to be engaged in early college and to have an early college designation. That's critically important in building our infrastructure. So, um, you know, what we know uh, is relationships matter, strong partnerships. We need the financial support we need to build in very strong wraparound services for our students. We need community support and engagement. We need to build early college into our strategic plans. And we need to have the professional development and collaboration that can be built across the Commonwealth through coalitions and consortia. So I, I think that's essentially uh, the recipe as we see it from the higher education side. And we are so excited uh, 
uh, to uh, be a part of this event today and to work with Mass Inc and MBAE and our wonderful partners in public education. Madam President, thank you for that. I'm so glad you talked about the wraparound services and the support that first generation students in particular get. Um, quick question for you from the higher ed perspective and for other folks in the audience who are representing higher ed institutions. Uh, how easy or challenging has it been? Uh, and, and I realize that Bristol Community College is, is ahead of the curve on some of these economic initiatives, but uh, how easy or challenging has it been to align uh, uh, your mission, uh, your curriculum to uh, uh, this programming. Um, it would be helpful, I think, to uh, for folks to hear, uh, you know, is, is it a, a massive effort or is it a matter of just kind of using some common sense and as you say, learning as you go? Well, we've certainly learned as we go. And I, I, I think that what's amazing about our relationship with Durfee is that we got our best results during a pandemic. And that is truly amazing when you think about it. I can see Drew shaking his head. And it's it's really, uh, I think it's it's been a, a learn as you go, uh, but it is an effort which takes commitment. You can't just say, okay, we're gonna do this and have faculty show up in the high school and teach classes. So, so it has to be very deliberate, very focused. And we know that it's going to take more uh, to be successful. So, um, you know, I, 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 uh, while we want to scale up, I encourage people who are new to this venture to, to take it slow, to do your research, to figure out what has really worked, uh, and to ask you the question, do we have what it takes, and how can we get to that point that we will have what it takes to be successful? Uh, we are very thankful that our uh, legislature has been uh, very uh, passionate about early college. I think that to sustain our programs, that we will not only, and to grow our programs, we will need to see uh, a higher investment in, in early college. Um, but for colleges, I, I think it's also critically important to know that you use your existing faculty to teach these courses and you wanna make sure that it's a good fit. And so we now have a very special uh, recruitment and onboarding program to make sure that the faculty that we are, uh, are uh, uh, using in our high schools are the right match. So again, lots of deliberate planning, uh, and we are very happy to share um, our success stories uh, with the rest of Massachusetts and uh, look forward to partnering um, in, a, in a very large scale across the, across the state. Thank you, Madam President. Julie, let me uh, turn the conversation to you. The, the One South Coast Chamber, which represents the entire region, has been very active on this issue of early college. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the, the support and advocacy role that the business community uh, has played? Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Happy to be part of the South Coast team on this call and very proud of all the work that's being done here. So th the chamber for decades now has brought together business leaders with educational leaders, nonprofit and community leaders to talk about uh, educational issues that impact the South Coast. Uh, we've convened um, government officials, nonprofits, all to talk about different topics. And most recently, early college has been a really risen to the top. That's something that we need to spend some time um, discussing how to scale up, how to support the programs like Drew has already discussed um, in the South Coast. Um, what's I think kind of great about the, pro the, the group that meets on a monthly basis at the chamber, it includes all different kinds of schools. Uh, vocational high schools, traditional comprehensive high schools, um, charter schools, uh, gateway cities, as well as uh, neighboring communities. Uh, higher ed, we're very, very pleased to have Laura sit at the table every month with us. We have UMass Dartmouth sit at the table with us. Um, and we've been pleased to have you, Ed, as well as even nonprofits like One Goal, which uh, Drew mentioned. So we really try to look at early college uh, from a different, from a variety of perspectives. One of the first things we want to do is educate the business community about, and the general community about the benefits of early college. Um, and we know that it can have a dramatic impact on student success and persistence, as we've talked about. We know that it reduces costs for first, particularly for first generation uh, families in the South Coast. And we know that from the business perspective, it's really important that we can leverage early college, 
now and in the future to develop a diverse pipeline of talent in the fields that we need to grow in this area. Laura spoke a little bit about that. And that's why it's really important to have education sitting alongside uh, business leaders, to have those discussions early on as we expand and add to the programs that are already in existence. So one of the things that we've been able to do in the South Coast is share best practices. Because we meet on a monthly basis and even more frequently, we've been sharing the experience that uh, Drew has had at Durfee, learning about how uh, New Bedford has put together their application. I know from my perspective on the Somerset Berkeley Regional School Committee that our school committee, our superintendent has learned, has reached out to Durfee to hear what they've done. Um, to kind of stop building those, um, those necessary pieces to put together a program in our own district. We've talked about, um, you know, we started with conversations on innovation pathways and shared best practices there. We've talked about PTEC. Just the fact of getting these people together on a monthly basis or even more frequently has allowed us to kind of really jumpstart that conversation. Our goal here, Ed, I think you've heard us say that is that so in the South Coast, we want every student, no matter what school they go to, no matter what town they live in, to have access to high quality early college programs. And I think that, that, um, that discussion is something that we focus on on a regular basis. How do we scale up? And to Laura's point, we wanna make sure we scale up with quality, uh, pointing to the things that are really crucial, like those support services. Uh, we know, uh, we're, we're very fortunate, we have some premier higher ed uh, education facilities in our area, Bristol Community College being one. The University of Massachusetts system is right now in the midst of a feasibility study for a um, statewide remote delivered early college program that will enable, that will hopefully enable that scaling up in the future. But some of the things that we've been talking about is how do we share those practices, but is there a way that some of the, um, we could look at potentially putting together a regional collaborative that will help that will help local districts fill programs that they might not be able to do on their own. So for example, just like a special education collaborative helps establish high quality special educational services across a number of districts in the region. Can we do that with early college? Can we establish some programs in the South Coast that would service not one, not two, but maybe a variety of districts in the South Coast? Help advocate, um, help recruit students, help facilitate the arrangements with our higher ed partners, whether it be Bristol or UMass or Bridgewater or other schools. Help us to provide those key support components on, on a scale that Laura talked about, you know, how can we enable that? We know in our discussions that um, it takes some work and Laura knows this because she's worked with, with schools here. It takes some work for each district to figure out how to overcome the natural obstacles that occur with implementing a program like early college. And so this collaborative would hopefully break down those barriers and make it easy so that a, a school could kind of, a, a district could sign in and say, okay, I only have three students who are interested in pursuing this early college pathways, but this other school has so many students also interested and maybe collectively we can advance that. So we're still in the early stages of that, but that's, those are some of the things we're talking about. And, and I think that the business community can continue to have a role in advocating for funding on the state level, but also looking for other ways uh, to support this initiative. In the end, it's, it's really all about making, um, I think, clear cut, easy to access pathways for our students in the South Coast to be successful in higher ed and then find a careers and as Laura say, stay here and continue to invest in the South Coast. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the kinds of things we're starting to talk about and continuing to build on here in the South Coast. Thank you, Julie, thank you so much. And uh, Superintendent Anderson, you get the last words. We'd love to have you kind of wrap up this South Coast presentation, talk a little bit about what your thinking is in New Bedford and, um, and uh, what we can all do uh, going forward. Good morning. 
and I guess, <clears throat> or good afternoon, depending upon <laughs> what time you started your day. But it, it's, it's great to hear everything that, that has been shared um, thus far. It's almost where I just need to say, I mean, we're, we're all in. And for everything that we've heard as far as the financial benefits, all of those type of things, the amount of courses that students are able to take to earn college credits, you know, that it's we're, you know, walking into this, you know, in the stage that we're in right now. But first, I wanted to, you know, I appreciate the time to briefly share some of the things that we're doing here in New Bedford to be part of the early college growth, but also want to thank my educator class administrator colleagues for their collaboration. And especially, we've already thanked them some other time, but especially the legislators for focusing on this work. And it's been used already using the term equity and making sure we're going through an equity lens and ensuring that those students who need the most amount of support are getting it and being able to pull them up and, and continue to push them and providing those financial resources, which, which, which need to really be sustainable as Dr. Douglas has mentioned before. So we know that equity in education is, is critical. I'm excited about the possibilities with our team and the things that we're doing, really being able to pre prepare students for these future jobs. I mean, we can name a lot of them that, that we think that are coming, but really being on the leading, you know, leading in that effort to ensure that they're ready. And also, so for what we're doing, we are, in part B of the application process for early college. So we're working with, you know, right now working with um, Bristol, Bristol, um, Bristol Community College with that part of it. We added a, you know, to, to further demonstrate our commitment and to make sure that our overall programming was getting enhanced. They added a position this past year that focuses on magnet enrichment and accelerated programs to ensure that we have individuals that are making sure that we're able to follow through you know, not just the application process, but once a program is there, you know, it's excited to hear the work that's being done in Fall River. And, you know, there's always that level of competition. So, of course, we want to make sure that we open up and, you know, we're learning from all the hiccups that everyone else has made. But, but seriously, that, that's what it's about, to really collaborate and learn. And we'll also hear some of the great work that's going on in Lawrence. But, uh, but, but the, the last piece is, again, the, the commitment that we have to the program. We're also in the process of adding, you know, the international baccalaureate program, seeing how that goes through from a primary years program to a middle years into high school, which goes into dual enrollment and early college. But it's really about creating a, that pipeline of students in those early levels to provide them with that level of support. So that way they're ready as we continue to move on. So again, you know, it, it's, it's good to go last where I've been able to hear everything that we can touch on. I learn, you know, hear, about, hear about all the money and those type of things. And, you know, for a quick second, I thought, well, maybe it'd be good to go back to high school, but I'm, I don't want to go back to high school at this point. <laughs> you know, we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to, to better support our students, you know, across the board. And it's a statewide effort. It's great that we're doing this work and being able to be a part of it in the South Coast but also thinking of it statewide and nationwide as far as how Massachusetts is leading in that effort and making sure that our students everywhere are getting the most amount of support. So, so again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much, Superintendent. I wanna thank all of our South Coast, South Coast leaders for uh, telling their story this morning, for their insights and their perspectives, but you know, more importantly, for the work they're doing on behalf of students. Now we get to uh, bring our spotlight to uh, more examples of the success of early college across the Commonwealth. It's a pleasure for me to introduce the superintendent of the Lawrence Public Schools, Cynthia Paris. Um, Lawrence uh, has a, um, uh, an early history uh, with early college, a great story to tell. Uh, and uh, Superintendent Paris uh, leads an educational system in another of our state's gateway cities. So this is an important part of our conversation this morning. And uh, for the next few minutes, uh, Superintendent, we'd love to hear about uh, what's happening up in the great city of Lawrence. Thank you. It's my pleasure to share the early college journey here in Lawrence. And I think in a moment, one of my colleagues is going to share their screen. Thank you. I'll start by sharing some statistical numbers so that you all get a flavor of where we are in our context. And so you'll see here that we have enrollment by the numbers, and I'll start by sharing who our partners are. We are partnered with Merrimack College and Northern Essex Community College. I can't say enough about the support that we receive from President Hopi and President Lane. They're truly, truly our champions. You can see here how many of our students are currently enrolled this year in both of our partner schools. In the next slide, what you'll see is the number success by the numbers. These are post-secondary -sec college enrollments. 
And you can also see where our students land in terms of their courses. Next, I wanted to share with you what it looks like to design these pathways. We work really closely and look at regional labor markets and then look further into um, labor markets with our partners to design these programs. Here's the snapshot of Northern Essex. And the next one, you will see the one from Merrimack. And then I also wanted to share with you a few promising practices that I hope you'll take away with you today. So as I shared before, I think the most important thing that um, is giving us quite the success is these two amazing presidents who continue to champion this effort. But I can't um, also, I also wanted to share the other partners who are key and essential to this success. We also partner with One Goal. One of my colleagues already mentioned that they also partner with One Goal, Lawrence Partnership, Groundworks, Mass Hire, and the Smith Foundation, who helped with the initial cohort and has continued their enormous support as well. The other thing that you should know is that right now we have had a few um, students at Merrimack College receive a Pioneer Scholarship. This has ensured that our students who are at Merrimack College, 10 of them have full tuition. So imagine this, you give our students the opportunity not only to take these courses in high school, and then it's like they won the lottery. Now they have a full ride that's room and board into the same institution that had already offered them the heads up, the legs up to be in college. I recently interviewed or was speaking to a parent who said, did you know that my student is now a sophomore in college? Of course, I knew that. But to the parent, it was surprising to know that, you know, their student had been taking these courses in high school. And now that they are enrolled in a four year college, they're sophomore. So many, many of these courses have been transferred into the four year institution. Here we just share a few again of the promising practices. No surprises here to you all. There, there's got to be this really strong collaboration between the institution and the high school. And we have to have strong, strong systems and structures. We have hired additional FTEs to really support our students. I'll also mention that the social emotional and the onboarding specific to our students who many of them are first generation students is really important. I recently interviewed some of our alumni and what they shared was that when they arrived in their four year institutions, they were quite surprised at how different things were. While they could intellectually and academically handle the experience of a four-year college, they were not prepared for the social emotional aspect. And I'll give you one example. Because of the early college experience, our students arrive in campuses with lots of credits and very strong academic foundations. And they're often enrolled in junior level courses at the college level. And so what happens if you can imagine now we have 18 year olds enrolled as junior in, uh, in, in college in those courses. I think that's wonderful. And so as you think about designing your program, remember that we're giving them this uh, enormous amount of intellect and academics and prepare them for college. And we still forget that they're 18 year olds now in classes with juniors and sometimes even with seniors at the college level. So don't forget to design the additional supports. And I invite you also to always yeah, hang out with your alumni, interview them, host roundtables. In the next slide, I'll share last of the promising practices. And this one I think has been a game changer. So Northern Essex has 
really refine the acuplacer, which as you know, is one of the assessments that help us identify the courses that students are taking. So the Northern Essex, along with the Lawrence High School team, have developed and refined that acuplacer in order to be very strategic about the courses that our students take while still in high school. I say this because oftentimes this is a measure of the success and many of our students who English may not be their first language will struggle with that acuplacer. So working very closely with our partner and refining that has been incredibly important in order for our students to be successful. I think this is the last slide here, but I did wanna add a few more things for you all, which is to say that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, being able to continually speak to students during this experience and anecdotally take, you know, some of their learnings as we go is really, really important. Notwithstanding, as you continue to leverage your funding and think about designing these programs as we have. As an example, right now, we've prioritized early college as an initiative and we'll be using ESSER funding mm -hmm. to make sure that we pay the full amount, of course, so none of our students have to pay, but that we continue to add those resources that I mentioned in the social emotional and the onboarding in terms of when students students leave us here, they're fully emotionally capable of um, taking full advantage of the college experience. And then lastly, I wanted to say that um, the high school team is exceptional at also ensuring that the success of the early college program is what it is today. We've graduated over 400 students. We are scaling the program up and we currently have 262 students in this cohort, and that's compromised of juniors and seniors. And next year, we hope to have nearly 500 of them between juniors and seniors in the program. And that has been careful and thoughtful scaling and strategic design of supports and partnerships with both Merrimack College and Northern Essex. Thank you for the opportunity to share our experience in the early college journey. Superintendent Paris, thank you uh, so much for your uh, presentation. It's now a pleasure for me to uh, introduce Colleen Coffey. She is the executive director of the College Planning Collaborative uh, at Framingham State University and Mass Bay Community College in the Metro West region of Massachusetts. So Colleen, welcome. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. And it is a pleasure to be part of this program. I know we've heard a lot of thank yous. So I want to um, use my five minutes by um, just allowing everyone to understand a little bit about a new approach that we've taken um, that's been unique to our Metro West region, uh, utilizing early college to really um, change the paradigm and uh, try to capture all of our equity agendas from both K-12 and higher education. Um, as Ed mentioned, we are um, the College Planning Collaborative, which is actually um, founded and run by Mass Bay Community College and Framingham State University. We are a joint regional college access initiative, and that is where our early college program lives. The advantage is that um, we belong to both of the higher ed institutions and we work within many different districts, but you know, intimately within Framingham uh, Public Schools and Milford Public Schools certainly, and we've just added Waltham Public Schools this last year. So we are five partners, um, five education partners officially in our Metro West region. And I hope to bring um, a few different ideas around the importance that I heard um, President Douglas mention, which is really around investment and foundation and wraparound support, which is really what we bring. That's why we've been successful and that's why we're scaling. Um, the work is not done. So we consider ourselves to be a five-year uh, program and a nine-year journey. And what that means is that we begin in middle school. 
Our program is unique in that we have an eighth grade on-ramp, but that allows us to be able to really um, you know, meet equity with action. And we have absolutely zero qualifiers to belong to the program. We're 100% open access. There are no tests, there are no recommendations, there are no, it's, it's a willing family that wants to belong. Another unique quality of our program is we enroll families, not students. We will not put in uh, a name on a roster without meeting with at least one caring adult who is going to be alongside on the journey. And um, in our region, many times we have seven caring adults or 12 caring adults that make up what is the family unit. It has been absolute game changing um, and it is the most impactful program that we've seen uh, change the landscape of the Metro West uh, since we've been in work and certainly um, since I've been in the business of college access. We hold consistent community enrichment meetings. Um, our scholars, we call them Metro West scholars, our scholars uh, anticipate them, they count on them, and our community space is not only safe space, but it's sacred space. So that means that we spend time outside of academic setting. I know there's a lot of talk about college credits. The college credits are golden, but we want the college credits to stay. So our end goal is college completion and a job. And in order to do that, um, within the work that we've held within college access and working on the pipeline from K-12 to higher ed, we know that we have to make that investment up front and that uh, our community of success needs to be very strong. Um, so uh, as uh, Superintendent Paris mentioned, the scaling needs to be careful. Um, it needs to be intentional. And we want those credits to really turn into completed degrees. And in order to do that, we have to put the work on the front end. We also are unique in that we have a lot of experiential learning. Um, this was so um, important for us during the pandemic. We are also one of those programs that actually thrived during the pandemic. We found creative new ways to do our business and we do believe that it made our program much better. So there are a lot of things that went wrong, but for us that went right. Uh, and our professors participate in community space. We think it's important to level that playing field and have our professors be able to serve our students in many different ways of mentorship. We also know that having personal, professional and um, community relationships with professors uh, turn into college completion for many. Obviously, as so many have already um, talked about, our academic structure and our social emotional structure is foundational. So we have uh, high expectations around academic structure our students begin taking classes the summer before ninth grade. Uh, we have a TA in every single dual enrollment class. That could be a college a student or a high school student, depending on the age of the dual enrollment class, but they are watching constantly what the need of the student is, where our ELL population is. We've also developed bridge courses for many of our academic courses. So if we feel that you know, our outcome would be better if we were able to prepare students with access or familiarity with concepts or words, we actually design a class that's non-credit and we hold the class before, and then we enroll them in the following semester. That's been a real game changer uh, for success and completion. The strong social emotional structure exists. We really um, held ourselves to this during the pandemic when we saw everybody suffering more, but now it's, in, it's made our program much better. We push in social emotional training into our dual enrollment courses. We uh, build in extra time. So we're able to have clinical social workers come in. That is one of the partnerships that we're most proud of. We also provide group wellness group uh, programs. So students can build time, additional time into their schedule to spend time and talk in group about where their stresses are, what it's been like to be, um, living in a house with people over the last two years while they're trying to become uh, a young adult and independent, where uh, peer pressure is, how to sort out emotions, a lot of problem solving. The other piece, um, and one of my last uh, slides is that we lead with community. So we pride ourselves on our grassroots effort Instead of designing the program around maybe what a traditional education is, we, we design the program around what our community of need is. And that really is 
you know, in church halls, community centers, sometimes on Main Street, um, locally owned businesses that might be part, you know, part of our members of our community, um, and certainly with community partners. We take this very seriously. This means that all of our meetings are in churches or community spaces where our uh, scholars' families are already participating. We've chosen those spaces based on who our scholars are, who their families are, and where they spend their time. And hopefully over the next 10 years, we'll eventually move into the education space, but our families spend time in community space. In addition to that, um, our families are at the center. Again, those relationships with families are core. So when we talk about building partnerships and building investment, those are family relationships. We have regularly scheduled calls. We have one position that's dedicated 100% to communicating with families. And then we always share news, all news, but mostly good news. Our pathways are social criminal justice, business, STEM, and education. And I was asked to just put a little bit more of a focus on the education pathway. All of our students, no matter what major they're going to be in, they all take an interdisciplinary course that's four credits before their ninth grade or during ninth grade. That covers four different careers and one of them is education. That gives all of our students the opportunity to learn what it is that they're actually about to embark on. So they're not making a decision out of like, um, no, without a process, let's say, without a process. Uh, so many of our students have decided that after taking the education course, they thought it was one thing, but they actually got to create their own school and they wanna be teachers. That gives them an opportunity to be able to take courses like cultural anthropology, where they're able to be seen and heard, but also be able to analyze all types of people in community. Education in American society, where they do site tours, they shadow, they have class visits in their district and out of district and partner districts. They also take equity in educational settings where they have an internship in an educational setting. And in many cases for us, they're influencing our higher ed institutions more than our actual uh, higher ed institutions are able to function on their own. So they're enriching our higher ed institutions. Um, this is a scope of what's happening this year. Um, we will have 862 expected, expected credits earned by the end of fall 2021. Um, we are way over the margin of what our profile schools are. Um, in some cases, we're over 30% um, more, uh, serving more of the equity gap we also want to emphasize that the equity gap is not only in our students, it's in our communities. So we push out as much information as possible within our community. So it's just not students by themselves learning what this is. And that's it. Thanks so much. Colleen, thank you very much. Uh, and we appreciate both uh, you and Super Superintendent Parrish sharing uh, these thoughts. It's a great pleasure now as, as we start to wind down the program uh, to bring forward some important information that's going to be presented by the research director of Mass Inc., uh, Ben Foreman. Ben, we're looking forward to hearing, uh, uh, hearing about this new research. Uh, thank you so, so much, Ed. I'm excited to share a, a few slides with you all this morning. And it's I called maybe um, part thought exercise here, part call to action. The first slide on my screen will be familiar to many of you. It comes from research that Massing published last June in partnership with the Boston Foundation. It was prepared by uh, Dr. Alicia sasser Modestino at Northeastern University. If you don't know her, she's an awesome labor market economist. And this was the first robust look at the impact of community college studies on income in Massachusetts. It found that graduates from our two-year public colleges earn about $6,500 more per year than high school graduates. The average annual earnings you see here on these slides about $23,000 for high school grads versus about $30,000 for associate degree holders may seem a bit low, but you shouldn't think of these as, as salaries. They're much lower because we're including uh, folks who aren't working at all or maybe working part-time. And they're just raw averages for the two groups. But the important thing to keep in mind here is that when we employ strong statistical controls uh, to, to, to adjust for selection, students who may have more advanced skills seeking community college degrees, 
we still find this $6,500 earnings gain, uh, about 25% more income annually. And you can think of this increment as what the individual would have earned given their abilities, uh, or how much more the individual has earned given their abilities because they have chosen to pursue a community college education. And over the course of a career, these earnings gains add up to a very large sum. An associate degree is worth at least $140,000 or more. And this is discounting to account for the time value of money, recognizing that students don't receive all the extra earnings in hand when they complete their community college degree. They flow to them paycheck after paycheck, year after year. This lifetime earnings estimate could be conservative because we assume the earnings gain is the same each year. And it may well be that associate degree holders see even larger labor market benefits from their college studies once they get further along in their careers. We'll have to wait for more data to be available to see if that in fact is the case. But regardless, it's clear here um, that the, the less tangible benefits from college are even more valuable than the earnings gains. Associate degree completion leads to greater health, longevity and happiness. And researchers who specialize in cataloging these kinds of gains estimate uh, that those that flow to individuals and families, what they call the private non-monetary benefits are worth one and a half times more than the earnings gains, which would put them north of $200,000 in Massachusetts. So let's turn now to the public returns, uh, which are much easier to quantify and understand. From the earnings gains alone, we estimate each associate degree holder pays approximately 13,000 more in state and local taxes. Uh, and we believe each associate degree completion yields more than $15,000 for the state in avoided public benefits, including reductions in the utilization of mass health, unemployment insurance, and housing assistance. And again, we're discounting all these flows, recognizing that the state recoups uh, these fiscal benefits over a lengthy time period. So putting all this together now, we can turn to our thought exercise. When we add up everything the state spends to educate a cohort of uh, community college students, uh, in this case, the, the, the class who took the MCAS in 2010, so probably entered around 2012, 2013, uh, the returns uh, from uh, tax collections and avoided costs versus what the state spends, we're roughly breaking even here. You can see on the right, that our math actually comes out with a very small net loss, which I hesitate to even show since it's a bit unfair because these are very conservative estimates. So I'm sure the state is roughly in a break even range. But I'm laying this all out to contrast with the ideal scenario. Imagine now if all students who sought a post-secondary degree through a community college achieved their goal, the state would spend more as those students persisted through further in their studies. Costs for the cohort would rise from about 59 million to 82 million but the net gains would be enormous. We go from break even on the previous slide to $165 million in fiscal benefit. And we could generate this kind of return year after year as each cohort passes successfully through our community colleges. Without question, the quality of education offered, including instruction, advising, and student support, things we've heard all about this morning, impact student success. We know from some very high quality research published recently that declining state investment in public higher education, especially community colleges, has lowered completion rates. If we want to position community colleges as a force for reducing inequality and generating economic mobility, then at a minimum, we should at least provide them with resources equivalent to what they generate in returns for taxpayers. And this last chart shows here that we're spending $16,000 less on each associate degree holder's uh, education then they provide back to us in fiscal benefits. With support from the Boston Foundation and the Smith Family Foundation, my colleague Simone Gongi Lakula and I have been working uh, on a report presenting all this analysis in much greater detail, and we hope to uh, publish that in the coming weeks. But after spending the entire summer down in the basement working on, on these spreadsheets and playing with these cost benefit numbers, there's one takeaway that I hope you'll leave with this morning. We've heard now. Uh, too many times that early college is expensive. Uh, it is clearly not. Underinvesting in students and not positioning them to achieve at their full potential is expensive. Community college graduates get at least $140,000 in lifetime earning gains 
plus $200,000 in non-monetary benefits. I think those of you we've heard from this morning who are doing the hard work of building early colleges are not doing anything expensive for the taxpayers. On the contrary, you're providing them with large fiscal benefits that allow for lower tax rates or improve government services. So please keep at it. Uh, that's all for me. Turn it back to you, Ed, thank you. And thanks so much. And I want to uh, uh, make sure that folks know that this presentation along with all of those that you've seen today as well as a recording of the event today uh, uh, will be on Mass Inc's website. It's now a great pleasure for me to wrap up the program and give the final word to Chairman Jeff Roy. Representative Roy represents the 10th Norfolk District, former chair of the Higher Ed Committee, current chair of the Telecommunications, Utilities, uh, and Energy uh, Committee, and a lead sponsor of Early College uh, legislation here in Massachusetts. Mr. Chairman, thanks for joining us today, and you got the last word. Well, thank you, Ed, uh, for that introduction, and thank you to everyone uh, for your great work on early college and for being here today. I specifically want to thank Speaker Mariano, Senate President Spilka, Chairman Mikowitz, and Chair Rodericks for their leadership and commitment to this effort. Uh, as a first-generation college student myself, I've seen the transformative power of education and my higher education journey substantially changed the trajectory of my life. And I wanna see that opportunity extended to everyone. College and other post-secondary opportunities are great springboards and powerful equalizers, as you heard time and time again from, from the speakers today. Expanding opportunity, rebuilding the middle class and closing the equity gap is the truest measure of economic growth and prosperity. And I know that's foundational for all of you here today. I'm here to tell you a bit about uh, House 693. It's a, a bill that uh, I filed along with uh, Representative Lipper Garabedian, and it's relative to college and high schools, which is that roadmap for success for students in our K-12 and higher education systems. College and high school programs, including early college, AP, IB, dual enrollment, industry recognized credentialing and innovation pathways are rigorously studied and proven tools to tackle post-secondary gaps and expand the share of the workforce with a post-secondary credential. And we have to build on our success to date in the early college spectrum and enhance and make a more robust college and high school experience for our students. And H693, H is that chance to provide these robust opportunities, no matter the background or identity of the students and give them an opportunity to take college courses in high school, engage in self-discovery and develop a mindset for success. H693 is a comprehensive plan that puts in place the necessary administrative, programmatic and funding structures required for an expansive and thriving college and high school experience. It establishes a new centralized college and high school office in DESE that is charged with defining and implementing all college and high school programs. It develops a sustainable funding mechanism to accelerate growth and provides additional financial incentives to programs that award industry recognized credentials to high school students. It helps ensure that students receive college credit for all courses completed. It encourages participation by students parents, and a network of support services. And at its most basic, it requires students to fill out a FAFSA, apply for aid, and take that step towards a post-secondary experience. The bill essentially offers a three for an out outcomes. First, it expands degree attainment, particularly for populations that are not doing nearly as well as we need them to. Second, it addresses the student loan crisis by reducing the costs of higher education for families and students. And third, it helps students with their career development. Folks, we have the brain power and personnel to do it well here in Massachusetts. And that's why I filed H693, and I look forward to getting that bill to the House floor as soon as possible. And with your help, we can do that. Thank you so much, and back to you, Ed. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, we appreciate it. And again, uh, uh, there's our call to action. Let's work to enact House 693. Let's ensure that we continue to grow early college 
in Massachusetts. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending today, for your advocacy, uh, for all you've contributed in building support, uh, especially what we hope you'll all help do in the coming months. I want to thank all of our panelists, our speakers, uh, co-hosts and co-sponsors, the Mass Business Alliance for Education is so proud to join Mass Inc. and Latinos for Education and bringing you this event. Again, the recording uh, for today's event will be on the Mass Inc. website later on today, along with all of the presentations. And a special shout out uh, to Monica Rhodes from Mass Inc., who did an awesome job pulling uh, all of the event logistics together. So thank you all for joining us. We hope you have uh, a terrific day and uh, let's move onward with a, a, a policy imperative that we know we can all get behind. Thank you all very much.